everybody and their neighbor. Welcome back to Gear and Gigs. I'm your host, Jed Stone. So glad you guys could stop by. Once again, my compatriot is here, Trey Hawkins. Trey, how you doing? <laughs> That's you, buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, me. No, I'm doing good. Awesome. Today, we have a special guest in the studio virtually. We have Doug Cower of Cower Guitars here. We are so honored to have you here, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm excellent. You guys won't be honored by the time you get tired of talking to me, but Sweet. thank you. <laughs> That's exactly the way you want to start an interview. Just bring the bar line down. We do that all the time. We're just like, yeah, I mean, we're not that great. Well, you can hit mute on me and put in whatever audio is much more interesting than I am, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, now you're underselling yourself. I've seen your wares and uh, oh, I'm sorry, if that's for me, that's, can you take a message? That's me. That's, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. It's a casual environment. It's a brave new world, the Zoom world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's actually the first time I've actually used it now. It's been oh, wow. uh, the kids and doing school. My wife's a teacher, so she's been doing a lot of it, but... Uh, that's about it. <laughs> and, for, and for those of you that aren't watching this, we are doing this through Zoom. And uh, so, you know, if there's any technical glitches or audio pops or whatnot, we blame them, not us. Yeah, that was uh, my kid's cousin FaceTiming to play Minecraft together. That, and I guarantee you that will happen <laughs> about 12 more times. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. My, my daughter's doing Roblox with friends. That's yep. the big one she does. So, yeah. Yep. <laughs> No, no more playing outside like regular kids. It's such a uh, weird world, isn't it? I won't lie. I've been on Red Dead Redemption 2 for the last about four <laughs> days. <laughs> it's nice. tight, Titanfall 2 for me, but yeah. Yep. <laughs> right there with you. Right there with you. Well, before we really get started in earnest, I, I do want to start off by saying, and it's true about all of our guests, you're, you're one of my favorite manufacturers. We only have people on the show that we really like, we really believe in their products. Well, thank and, you. And man, I'll tell you, you do some of the coolest, coolest stuff with such a high standard. I used to build uh, bikes and, and uh, choppers and, and hot rods and stuff. So I'm, I'm really into the, the building, you know, philosophies and stuff. And man, every time I see one of your things, I'm like, holy crap, this is awesome. <laughs> I, well, I, I can't. I can't get him to stop sending me screenshots and, and photos <laughs> of your guitars. He's just like, "This is the best one." And then ten minutes later, like, "No, no, 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 no! You got to look at this one." Oh, but see, I landed today. I, I think. I think that's the one that trips my yep. trigger in, in such a big way. Oh my god, the Argonaut in general. Oh, Our Argonaut's amazing. I mean, that one especially. That was has the Balm P90 covers, which is probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done. Uh, trying to run the binding bit around that piece of plastic and not, you know, lose a finger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that guitar, so Daylighter was the original Cower. Right. Uh, and Argonaut is, okay, sorry, backstory. Yes. Almost all of the guitars that we build are named after trains. Uh, oh, Sacramento is a that, yeah. uh, So Daylighter was the original. And then Argonaut is actually the same engine as the Daylighter was just a different line and color scheme. So it seemed like a natural pairing to build kind of the, you know, Argonaut's kind of a daylighter, but it, with a double carved body and everything, it's kind of its own thing. I, it's been fun to watch. Uh, we had some Instagram takeovers uh, with customers of mine that have, you know, a lot of cowers, a lot of unique cowers. And uh, both of them are like between two of them. I think they own 80% of the Argonauts. Oh, wow. uh, Wow. Because there's not that many. I think there's only like 30, maybe 40 Argonauts total. Um, and they probably have had or had at least half of those, wow. Uh, wow. if not most of them. Uh, so it was kind of neat to see that. The blue one is not one of the ones that they owned, but uh, uh, it's been neat. It's kind of weird because I've generally found that whatever we make outside of Banshee has about a three to five year lifespan. Uh, and then it kind of just tapers off and peters out. Uh, and I want to make new things, and I'm always trying to make something new anyway. And, uh, and so Argonaut's been out of the rotation for probably three years now since Super Chief replaced it. And it's been neat to kind of watch this groundswell of people that have kind of all of a sudden discovered Argonaut recently and uh, uh, wondered why we're not making them. And then I tell them what they cost, and they suddenly understand why we're not making them. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that one wasn't cheap. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I probably, but gosh, it was so beautiful. I, I didn't know if they were P90s or like a de thing. I wasn't yep. sure. 
yeah, there are P90s in that one. We, uh, uh, it was fun. That was, we built it for, it was a custom order, but it was also built to go to NAM. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just like doing the P90s with the binding on the top ring and making the pick guard match. And it was just kind of fun. Um, honestly, the binding is what we call dumb hat trick mode, where it's, we routed the cover um, with the binding bit like normal. And basically, I just took a piece of wood that kind of fit inside the cover so I didn't have to put my fingers next to the, the router bit and then kind of ran it around the router. And then I laser cut out of a solid piece of acrylic the binding ring. So it actually snapped on over the top of the, the cover oh, yeah. uh, and then glued That's it cool. in and then, you know, sanded it, flushed, repolished it all out. Um, so that was kind of cool. That that was one of those things that was just hey, – that guitar needed, like, something. It just – P90s are tough because they kind of can disappear. Yeah. And they don't have the flash visually that, like, a humbucker has. Uh, it's kind of the same problem, like, strap pickups look weird if they're not on a strap pickguard. Like, yep. certain pickups are hard for that. So that kind of that kind of turned out to be a good way to make it pop still. And that, that guitar needed it. Um, and it was funny because I – that guitar, I remember specifically uh, – that NAM show, we were neighbor-ish with uh, Claudio Pagelli, who is just Claudio and Claudette are unbelievably I, my favorite designers in the entire industry. They're they're amazing people. They're so ridiculously cool. It's annoying. Uh, and uh, Claudio came up. See, told you it was going to happen again. Uh, <laughs> That's the problem with all the iOS stuff. It's all linked together here. <laughs> oh. Uh, but anyway, Claudio came up to me at NAM after NAM, and and uh, he goes, he pointed to that argument and goes, that looks like something I would have designed. And I, I'm not gonna lie, there is some of his DNA uh, that's rubbed off on that guitar. And I was like, thanks. He's like, no, I love it. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure which way it was going yet. Yeah, <laughs> it was a big compliment. I, yeah. I was, you know, it's a cool guitar. It is, man. I tell you, it really strikes me. What's uh? How is it wired switch wise? I didn't I didn't notice that one. I'm trying to remember. I think that one has a five way strat switch, if I remember right. Oh, cool. So it'd be it would be pretty straightforward. Oh uh, no, it looks like a three way. Is it three way? So that one, way? if it's three way, it'll be three volumes and a master tone. But what we do that's a little different. We do the same thing with Banshee, uh, because Banshee is too thin to fit a five way switch. Uh, we put the middle pickup on its own push pull pot. Uh, oh. So when it's off it's out of the circuit. So it doesn't affect the, the resistance values of the other two pots. Um, right. And when it's, and then when it's on, so you can kind of turn it on and off when you want. So you still get all seven pickup combinations. It's just a little bit more involved. Uh, that was something I, I kind of figured out early on the first Banshees back before the way before there were Banshees, when I was still building uh, just as a hobby, um, the first few Firebirds that I built essentially uh, were all three pickup Firebirds, and I had one that I think had a pe- stray piece of solder that I or some wire strand that was grounding out, and so I pulled the middle pickup temporarily out of the the circuit, uh, and it sounded great. And then when I wired it back in, it sounded like. Sh-. <laughs> and uh, it, what I realized what was happening is when you would turn that middle pickup off, like in a Les Paul Custom, it's mm-hmm. basically taking the value of the tone or the volume pots and having them. So instead of having essentially a 500k pot it was loading the pots down so they were like 250ks um and so it's not real noticeable on the neck but on the bridge it's pretty noticeable uh and so by just putting in a push pull pot in or a, a you know in, in the case of banshee we use a little slight like a jaguar style slider switch it pulls it out of the circuit and then that way at least the neck and the bridge would be like a traditional two pickup guitar they, they will sound exactly like that uh, so that works pretty good and then it's nice too because the other problem too is that you got three volumes to keep track of and the middle pickup I think looks cooler than maybe it is used by most people. Right. Uh, I, I love a middle pickup, but I, you know, I don't think most people actually use it that much. So it's, you know, when you're not using it, you just slap that switch and get it out of the way. So. Well, that's a good way to do it. That's cool. Well, man, yeah. how, how, uh, how did you get started? Cause you're obviously a very smart guy and, and thinking mm-hmm. about all of these kind of things. Well, you know, <laughs> Dude, I the jury's I'm still out a little bit, man. <laughs> Give it time. It seems pretty good, but, but know, you know. I've been lucky to fall kind of ass backwards and quickly learn from it uh, and, gotcha. and apply those lessons uh, rather quickly. But, well, my, my dad has a cabinet shop, so I grew up uh, working in the shop since I was a little, I mean, little, little kid. He, uh, 
he actually went to school in, to an automotive college. He wanted to be a, a mechanic, and then he realized that sucks. Uh, and then he moved to what he really liked doing and, uh, was, he was a parts, he worked in the parts department at Stockton Dotson at the time, uh, and ended up becoming a parts manager. Um, dad loved that. Annoyingly, there was some system that Dotson had, which became Nissan for how their parts worked. And he knows that system to this day. And he still knows part numbers <laughs> for like five tens and two forty Z's, uh, right. And I can't remember a phone number. It's so I didn't get that gene, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> like that guy has to, like I'm the guy they invented uh, the copy and paste for the like the one time codes that you get in text message because I was always I get like halfway through it. I'm like, Shit, what was that number? Yeah, so I'm that guy. Uh, but yeah, I just grew up doing it. And and yeah. uh, one day, you know, some maple came in the shop that was getting to be probably just turned into crown molding and it was really pretty. And, and I played guitar and my dad played guitar and I tinkered with guitars and I just put two and two together, started reading on the internet and, and, you know, luckily the, the woodworking side was, I, I had a good background in, it was more like fret work and guitar specific wiring and some of that stuff that I hadn't done that much that I, right. uh, I was able to learn from my father-in-law who had done that kind of stuff. And, uh, just, Kept making guitars. That was, uh, yeah. I don't know, 1,300 guitars ago now. And, oh, uh, wow, 1,300. <laughs> just keep showing up to work and keep trying to make new ones. Um, I noticed your process. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say you, you said you were kind of building your building as a hobby. You were kind of doing the Banshee or the, or the precursor to the Banshee. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the first model for? No, it wasn't. I, I So Firebirds, building a Firebird clone, essentially, uh, was the first thing I ever truly built from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, so the guitars that before that were like Strat and Tellys, you know, and I, right. I loved to buy the necks. And, and I was making a lot of bodies for other people for that were friends. Um, but the guitar that launched the business was actually the Daylighter. So I okay. designed that, made it, and people started calling me and asking me or emailing and calling about, you know, would you build one of those for me? Ah, this is going to drive me insane. I don't know how to turn that off. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to get faster at it, though. Is it an uh, iPhone? <laughs> yeah, it's just coming up on my, my laptop, too, though. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, it'll, be, it'll make for great comic relief, I'm sure, here, because they'll continue to do that for an hour. Uh, and otherwise, thinks just, Minecraft now every single time too. So yeah, it's well, I'm not, for Minecraft, it's either they do that or they'll be in here interrupting this interview. So <laughs> it's kind of a win lose whatever. Uh, but yeah, the the daylight of people just want it. You know, really liked it. It, yeah. it was. I kind of credit that with uh, you know Tom, uh, not Tom, uh, Dennis Fano and I. I think both kind of hit that you know, jazz master, not a jazz master thing. I think we kind of both came to it around the same time independently. Mm -hmm. And uh, people, uh, I, you know, seem to be really in you know, right place, right time for it. And I was really adamant. I'd had a business kind of from a hobby before that, um, that just ruined the hobby for me. Right. Uh, I was like, I'm never going to be self-employed. I'm going to finish my teaching degree. You know, uh, I, I don't want anything to do with this. And then the recession hit. And there just wasn't much else to do, to be honest. It sounds horrible. Um, right. But by then, I, I had really gotten into really, you know, deep into it and really started enjoying it and feeling comfortable about starting to let guitars go with my name on it. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, just kind of went in from there. And then it wasn't until a few years later that people had remembered that I had built Firebirds and we got kind of badgered into bringing those out. And I, <laughs> I was real hesitant to do it because it, I, at the time, other than making kind of under the hood structural improvements of that guitar, there wasn't really anything that made it distinguishably mine. Sure. Uh, and so, but you know, you're trying to pay bills. And so it's kind of hard to say no when people want work. And, and right. so we started doing it. And then I kind of got a reputation of building very roadworthy version of a guitar that's notoriously fin finicky. Sure. Uh, and that's, yeah, kind of like that's how we met Walter Becker and, and a bunch of guys that were, you know, looking at buying vintage Firebirds, but they didn't really want to take them on the road. Right. Uh, and, you know, at least with ours, you could buy a couple of ours for every vintage Firebird. And if right. you broke one, it, you know, it's not a piece of history that just got broken. It's, you know, I can be right. fixed or replaced. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, people started figuring out what we were doing was making that guitar better anyway. 
Sure. Uh, so the thing that saved me uh, <laughs> before I get sued again uh, was we had looked into the legal aspects of when I when I was building those right. at the time, and there was no conflict legally. Um, Gibson hadn't filed any trademarks on Firebird. So when we had our little spat years later into this, I was thrilled, actually. I get to redesign that guitar to be the current version of Banshee, which is still in the vir- you know Firebird vein of mm-hmm. uh, style, obviously, but a lot of improvements. It's a, it's a, you know, every corner of that guitar is different. All the lines are different. Right. Um, it, it really let me do a lot of things that I really probably wouldn't let, people wouldn't accept until I could just say, I can't legally do the other one. <laughs> right. Well, and that, that, uh, the one that, um, we got in at the guitar sanctuary that we got from the, the road show, sure. uh, the, the zero Cote one, mm-hmm. gosh, it just, you pick it up and it feels solid. Like you're right. Yeah. Like you pick up a, a firebird and although I love the shape and everything, it's always kind of been like, I mean, this is cool while I'm standing here, but I couldn't really see myself playing this sure. in, in the fashion. And I'm, I'm pretty rough on guitars and, and I could just never do that. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we got it in and I picked it up and my, my buddy Brian that works with me, he and I were both just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, this that is was, the coolest. That's a really neat one too. It, so that, that version, so we call that the deluxe where we mm-hmm. mill, basically we still make the body exactly the same way, body and neck. And then we milled down around the neck or basically around underneath the fretboard. So that part stays the same. And then we mill everything else down and apply the top to it. Right. Uh, and then, and that opened a whole new world for Banshee. Uh, so right. that, that was one of the early deluxes. Uh, and it's been neat because it's not only has it opened up surprisingly sonically on that guitar, it, the deluxe is substantially different sounding than the normal Banshee. Um, it's been nice too, because it's opened up a whole kind of, new realm of finishing and because it i mean mm-hmm. a solid mahogany banshee you know there's only one or two sunbursts you can spray on it it's not sure. all that interesting but the the maple tops and the zircote we've done burl a lot you know not a ton but you know handfuls of these kind of more exotic tops uh, it's kept that guitar interesting to me um and i i really like uh honestly it's ironically uh here i'll sort of pan around so i have three super chiefs on the wall yeah, uh, and a handful of you know guitars in the other room. Um, I don't have a banshee. I, I actually rarely have a banshee for myself for very long. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had I had one keeper that I lo- just adored. Uh, it was actually a customer's guitar that got broken in shipping. I mean, it just got. I mean, I I, I think literally a gun safe was like the next thing that came down the Ooh. chute and just just accordion the thing like six inches shorter in the box. It was insane. Uh, so we built a new one for him and then I ended up repairing it, uh, for myself and played it for a few years. And I just love God. I, I will yell at the kids the next, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk in text here at the same time, tell them to stop doing, uh, anyway, uh, so I, I repaired it. Um, and, uh, uh, a few years later I sent it to summer Nam. Uh, in a pinch, uh, we were, I can't remember what the deal was. I, I think the Banshee that I was going to send sold or something. So I just sent that one in a pinch and it got broken again, which is oh. probably more related to my repair skills uh, <laughs> than maybe anything else. Uh, so it sat for years and I ended up giving it to Greg Platzer at BCR Music, who's a great friend of mine. And just like, here, have at it. I, I'm never going to get around to fixing it. I'd much rather just build a new one for myself. Sure. Um, so I haven't had one in a few years, and then we did the deluxe, and I, I've got a Sunburst one that's here now that's technically inventory, but I haven't actually put it on the website yet. <laughs> like, it's really good. I, I would really like to keep that one, honestly. Right. Uh, that no, guitar, I'm sorry, you can't. You have to sell it. I, I should, honestly. I, I think sometimes what I'll do is on something that I kind of might want to keep around for a while, like I'll float it out on Instagram, but I won't really put it on the website. I'll be like, yeah, just contact us if you want this one. And if it sells off Instagram, right, right, and to be. But if and I'll get any nibbles, and I'm like, yeah, I'll keep it for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, that man, I, you're just setting these up for me. That that blends into one of the questions that I that I really wanted to ask was how has Instagram affected your business? Because I mean, just even for anybody that hasn't kind of been following the the 
meme March Madness thing that you've been doing, which <laughs> by the way so has fun. been fantastic. I have loved and and uh, I can't remember if you're are you actually doing a Macho Man shirt? Yeah, I I'm not convinced there's gonna be a winner name or that we'll be there at this point. Yeah. But the next time I get to do an event, whether it's Cower Fest or nam 22 or whatever i will absolutely wear the the macho man outfit there's yes yeah it'll happen uh or i'll wear it for halloween or something I, it will happen uh that was you know i i love instagram now i i have my gripes i definitely think instagram was better before facebook took over it uh sure. and there's some you know social influencer businessy gripes about that but generally Instagram is my favorite place to be. We, we actually, I've gotten to the point now, I kind of feel bad. You know, like we, we had the Facebook page and everything, and I, I don't think I even updated it more than a couple times a year, which was terrible from a business perspective, but I just, just that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah. Um, but, but Instagram's been great, and I've made, it's been really good for business, uh, obviously, but it's been really good for, uh, surprisingly, like just making friends in other industries. And right. um, I have this great story about uh, this watch that I own. It's called an uh, indicator, and which I'm not wearing right now. I uh, wear my work watch. But uh, it's um, the face is basically patterned after like a dial indicator uh, or like a micrometer. Um, right. And it's just this gorgeous handmade watch and by a guy in a – I feel like a missile silo in somewhere in Russia – uh, and you know, it was one of those things that like, I was, I will literally watch all, well, I won't watch people make anything basically. Um, <laughs> because I'm always, you know, especially manufacturing, but right. I also might watch a lot of triple D, uh, <laughs> but you know, Instagram, especially kind of early on was kind of this little haven of these small boutique, you know, manufacturing, you know, watches, knives, uh, yeah clothing outfits and stuff, even stuff that's not normally my wheelhouse and sure. um, that I ended up becoming, you know, just following along because I was fascinated about the process. Right. Uh, and that watch maker turned out one day I realized he was following me uh, mm. and I was following him and I was like, well, this is easy. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a super sweet guy and, and uh, uh, you know, he's got, he probably posts more videos of him playing uh, his cower from his missile bunker um, than, you know, almost anybody I know on Instagram, honestly, uh, you know, set my kids gifts last year, just out of the blue. And as he's, so I, those aspects of Instagram, I love, uh, yeah. it's, it's very much my speed. Uh, I feel like the last week or two, I've kind of been a little overwhelmed with everything going on. And I've kind of, sure. I, I just haven't had as much to post lately because I haven't been working as much and more mm -hmm. when I have, um, the downside to Instagram and, and really, all of the, the time we live in right now is <laughs> especially the last six weeks with everybody stuck at home. Uh, I'm kind of, it's partially why I kind of spaced out on getting here on time. Uh, everybody's been talking to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got nothing else going on a little bit, right. but it's, you know, Instagram and the direct messages and, uh, you know, Facebook and emails and phone calls. And finally I was like, I just, I, I, I need a break. Uh, I, 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 this sounds very ungrateful because we, literally had such an amazing run of customers supporting us for the last six weeks up mm -hmm. until our, you know, federal assistance came through. Right. Uh, but I also know that I kind of have the assistance. I feel like I can take a week off and I'm sure. Gonna, yeah. I think that's going to be next week. I'm just going to check out for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's funny that you bring that up. We were talking to Brian Porter a couple of days ago from, from Porter pickups and sure. he, he, uh, we were talking about his, you know, pickup design or a uh, pickup pickup chooser form that he does on his thing that that I ran across, you know, on their website, and um, that the, the the phenomenon of of with all this stuff going on, it was like, yeah, he's so good at it that the mm -hmm. conversation was over so quick that it was kind of like this. Well, I mean, you know, do, do you want to hang out? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What, what you've been watching like, like yeah you know, like the but i get it like the you know people like even like the conversation that you and i had a, a couple weeks ago like just that's the cool part that i like too and it's, yep. and it's awesome to hear that that that's you know kind of a a part of the business model that i mean that's really the first time i think that we've seen you know in at least within our industry where people are a little more accessible for better yeah, or worse absolutely. like but it's cool, especially for like a smaller builder or somebody that's doing things that are, 
more attention to detail and there's definitely more uh, kind of love and affection in you as a customer wants to be involved in that process and feel like it's kind of a community thing. Yeah. So I, I kind of learned early on that, you know, as the business has kind of ebbed and flowed and tried to grow that I, I can't be separated from the selling aspect of the guitars that everybody right. as much as I would love to not have to be the guy that answers the phone and all the emails and all the tweets and everything else. Everybody wants to talk to me and that's great. I, I'm not upset at all about that. And I've made a genuine effort to always try to respond to people. Even when I get the endless, you know, I have a hundred followers on Instagram, please give me a guitar <laughs> request. Uh, you know, I try to be polite. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, also this industry and in, is unlike, I have found very few avenues in life that has as much openness and collaboration as mm -hmm. this industry. And the pedal guys are the same way too. Amazing. Oh, yeah, it's, for sure. Kind of all of it. There is very, and I've, I think I've told this to a lot of the people, I've probably met a thousand of the biggest name luthiers in the business, which doesn't mean much, but you know, two of them are assholes. Like that's like right. 0.2%. I mean, I have 20 people in my family and I probably don't like 10 of them. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of amazing that, yeah. And so I always, you know, the advice that when people ask me for advice, I try to be cognizant of that. You know, I was that guy too. And, and my favorite thing about Nam or any guitar show is just, frankly, drinking way too much beer with my friends. And then we all commiserate about how none of us make any money, but we all also <laughs> thoroughly enjoy nerding out about, you know, how I made those, you know, uh, P90, Ballon P90 covers or how we're right. doing, uh, you know, our binding on the CNC machine or cutting inlays with the laser or, you know, UV finishing or, and, and it, that goes, I mean, I, I spent the day with Bob Taylor and he's the same nerd in that exact, you get him right. going about, how they're doing things and he's nobody's happier to talk about that stuff uh so it's 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 and instagram also has a lot of that you know facilitate yeah. a lot of that too that's it's it's kind of amazing well I, I feel like we're all just kind of a bunch of nerds like yeah. really, <laughs> like at the end of the day like uh you know even just the fact that you're like yeah i've been playing red dead red dead redemption a lot like jet and i are both gamers and like there's the, there's just this especially when you're in the kind of the techier side of the industry mm -hmm. um you know, it always kind of bums me out when like an artist or, or somebody that I really, really look up to goes, yeah, man, I don't really know what I play. I just play. Well, <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's awesome. And I wish that I could yeah. be that, but my brain is so wired to be the want to talk about all the, you know, well, how did you do that on that guitar? Or, you know, yeah. how did you get that sound or what combination did you use? Like that's the stuff that really gets me going and, and it gets me excited about playing because sure that conversation I go, well, oh my gosh, well, I don't have that, but I've got this. And what if I could do this to make what I've got sound more like this? And, and it just kind of sparks that yeah. mutual creativity and everything. I, I definitely find there's a, there's a threshold at both ends for me. Like there, sure. there are people who, who make claims or think things are certain ways that I'm like, mm, okay, <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, and, and then the, the, there's a couple people on the, the two people I don't like list that are notorious for that. Uh, and I just kind of take that with a grain of salt. And, you know, at the same time, you know, I've met plenty of people that are, you know, I've got a $300 Samick that sounds like a 59, you know, original 59 burst. And I'm like, mm, okay, I'm sure you do. And, but you know what, if it brings, if my overall philosophy has always been, and I, this is kind of sad where I'm at, uh, you know, the old, there's the old substance joke about, you know, Homer's complaining that every time he learns something new, something old gets pushed out. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked me the other day what the magnets were in our humbuckers, our, our cower wines from Wolf, and I could not remember because it's been oh. 10 years. <laughs> yeah. I haven't thought about it. You know, I have, we settled on a formula a long time ago with Wolf uh, after trying everything. I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're Al Noco 2s, but I can't remember. I, you know, I don't know if you, <laughs> I, I, I think yeah. so. And then, like, and then it was like, well, what wire? And I'm like, oh, God, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, and I'm like, I don't make the pickups, so I probably should know this because it says power bucker on them, but I don't know. They just sounded good. I, I tried out six picks up, pickups from Wolf and gave my notes, and that's where we ended up. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I, 
I get both ends of it. I, you know, one of our artists is notoriously that way. Uh, Dennis from Flogging Molly is a, he's not a gearhead by any stretch. Like he, right. he has great gear and he, I wouldn't say is okay. He's definitely specific about, it. he knows what he wants it to sound like or, or sure. play like, you know, but he's not real hung up beyond that point. You know, right. it, it, you know, Oh my God, it's not nitro fish. You know, he doesn't, care. Right. He, he, you know, that's not, he's not in the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and he's one of my favorite people to go hang out with whenever we see him in town, as soon as he remembers my wife's a teacher, we end up spending the entire time talking about the local school districts, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a, <laughs> I think sometimes he's a little relieved to get away from that, but, uh, sure. uh, yeah, I, I, I somewhere, I'm somewhere in the middle, you know, right. I, I tend to think that we can sometimes get too bogged down, um, or too locked into, uh, certain things that are internet has decided is good or right. Bad. Uh, you know, oh, I hundred percent. No, yeah. I, I, I get a little judgmental. I, I kind of, I, I got into an argument with some time, not an argument, but close with, with somebody, and, you know, about how we're building things. It was probably, Oh, actually I know exactly where it was. It had to be YouTube of course, cause it's always YouTube. Right. Uh, I think we have one video in our YouTube account and it's a video that, we get like three quarters of the way kind of filming the process. And then I just ran out of time and energy. And I was like, eh, good enough. Uh, you know, let's throw it on the internet. I'll come around and finish the second half after NAM or something. And it's been years now. But, you know, people are like, oh, you know, the guitar is not handmade because there's CNCs involved. Or, and I just finally was like, you know, <laughs> I'm the guy making this thing. And so I'm not going to let my customer dictate what I think is the best tool for the job. I'm, it would be like getting heart surgery and telling the doctor what they should use. Yeah. You know, just trust me on, if you don't like the end product and that's impure, that's, there's no right or wrong. Sure. Or not. That's fine. But don't tell me how to get to where I think the best product that we can make is, you know, and don't be hung up about what tool we use. If we, if I think it makes, I'm never going to use it something that I think makes a worse guitar somehow. Right. Or not twice at least. Uh. <laughs> well, I, I feel like people forget that. They're like, you know, you're not trying to make a bad guitar. Especially no. like in, in, in like the Cower brand, like they're not inexpensive guitars. You're not looking for the, I want my very first Squire bullet right. type of customer. So it, it should imply by the nature of, of what you've done and the brand that you built for yourself that you want to do everything as best you can. You, yeah, you know, I, I agree. I, I think uh, we've been lucky that we've kind of left some of that behind. Like I, I just don't engage and, and I yeah. just very much harp on the you either like what we make or you don't. I'm not mm -hmm. offended if you don't. That's why if everybody liked the same guitar, it would be freaking boring. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, well, those were hard fought battles to get, you know, it is that same trap of like, everybody kind of has to build a Strat or a Tele to get started. Right. You know? And then there's guys who just build Strat and Tele's and it's, I, I understand it. They probably sell more guitars than I do, but it's not a long-term strategy and things that are distinctive design elements about our guitars took a long time for people to accept them. And then sure. not only to accept them, but to embrace them and enjoy what I enjoyed out of those design elements. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's been 13 years now. Um, and that's, you know, this kind of finally hit, uh, Banshee right. is a great example of that because when we had to stop production on Banshee, um, the, <laughs> and by the way, if I'm talking too much, please interject, but, uh, no, no, no. Uh, this is literally the point <laughs> of, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will ramble down on a topic pretty hard, but, uh, so when, when Banshee B1 had to cease, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had all these people, you know, as soon as you bring Banshee back, let me know, put me on a list, put me on a list. And there was probably, I don't know, a hundred people on this list. And we brought out Banshee B2, which I think, and I believe to my core is a empirically provable, better guitar in every regard, visually, structurally, you know, sonically, it's a, it's just a better version of that guitar. It took it nine months to start seeing sales on that guitar. Yeah. And, and not one of the hundred people on that list ordered one. Uh, they may have bought one years later, but it just took this long time for like, in my mind, I'm like, oh man, we're back. We're going to, you know, I have to sell a hundred of these right away. And it was like right. just crickets for a year. And then, and now five, six years later, people who have Banshee V2s and then either, you know, uh, Firebird or, or an original Banshee, when they hang them side by side, they go, you know what? You're right. You, you, 
those changes you made makes that a better looking guitar. Sure. Uh, and I'm like, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a, um, do you have like a, a guiding philosophy, you know, like uh, Leo Fender, they always said he, he had durability and performance and then uh, expense is his third, you know, criteria. Sure. What, what, what do you go in when you're starting to make a guitar, either a new one or a custom one for somebody based on a, a design you already have? What's your ethos? That's the word I always try to throw in there, right? There it is. What's your ethos behind it as you're, as you're creating? Sure. Well, visually, you know, I, I try to thread a needle. I, I mean, I design stuff that makes me happy. It, yeah. it, I think if you do anything other than that, it's just not going to work. So, right. you know, uh, or, or makes the shop collectively happy. I, I will listen to the five people in the shop a little bit. Uh, if they could draw an AutoCAD, I'd probably have to listen to them more. Uh, <laughs> but they can't yet, so, uh, or haven't yet. But, uh, you know, visually, I, I kind of sit in the camp of, our stuff is not groundbreakingly out there. It's, you know, kind of threading the needle of, you know, 50s, 60s, kind of retro, modern, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I tend to have some bold design choices. I tend to be in the offset camp pretty firmly. So, uh, you know, our, I tend to, we've been doing a lot of flat tops the last few years and our flat tops, you know, have very specific pick guard designs that usually are not like they're, they're contrast to the body shape. So yeah. extent. they're, I tend to drink a pick guard kind of like it can be its own thing and make its own statement. And that's something that was one of those things that was hard fought for people to start. And I still get people that kind of complain about them, but I think they would complain no matter what. Um, but I like that part of it. And then, but I also tend to be kind of a pragmatic guy. I don't want to make things that are impossible to work on or maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so like one of the improvements with Banshee was a simple improvement, but just making the control cavity and the spacing between all the pots a little bit bigger. So it was easier to get in there and work. Right. Uh, and that's something that, you know, me and my assembly guy and probably three people on earth will ever notice, but it helps. Uh, right. You know, Super Chief has the giant pick guard uh, and there's no option for it not to have the pick guard. It's, it's fundamental to the way that guitar is put together. Sure. But what that lets me do is it routes the body for a P90 and a humbucker. So that gives you some options that you could change that out to a different pickup layout pretty easily. The pickups themselves are on these little quick connectors that I've used since Argonaut. Right. Uh, so we can kind of fish all the harness in and then plug the pickups in and not have all that stuff dangling around. And then like today, I had a, a customer who bought a, or, uh, not a, I'm sorry, a Super Chief and then had it sent to us. So I had Plek it, it's an older one, uh, and then add a Veritone to it. So I had to fish all the harness back out and then it just wasn't that big a deal. I was happy to do right. it. And then, you know, I was able to rework it so we didn't add any holes to the guitar. Uh, you know, all the controls fish out uh, through the pick there. When you pull the pick guard, there's a big opening under the pick guard to get everything out. Uh, you know, and so I, I tend to be from a production -y point of view, very pragmatic, very, you know, practical on things, uh, which yeah. is a lot of how Titan was kind of conceived. And, and we learned a lot of lessons from that when we were doing Titan. Uh, what, about so sonic, sonic, what about sonically? Sonically, we tend to be in the Gibson camp. Uh, that's kind of my wheelhouse. So most now we do from time to time do a bolt on model uh, kind of varies. You know, we had Arcturus. We're going to work on something new right now um, that's more Fender flavored. But um, I do have a pretty specific formula I like to stick to. It's Spanish mahogany bodies, Spanish mahogany necks. That That is fundamental to what makes cowers sound like cowers. Um, uh, and and Spanish mahogany is a uh, – the other trade name is Spanish cedar. It's not cedar or Spanish. Um, it's a Honduran cousin. <laughs> um, so we, we kind of pulled the Gibson thing, and I got tired of explaining it and just – started calling it a Spanish mahogany to skip a step. Right. Uh, but it's, it's a mahogany variant that honestly, uh, Yuha Rikongas from Finland turned me on to, God, 12 years ago now. And it was like the first guitars that came together was like, that is it. That was my, yeah. you know, Marvin Berry moment, you know. So what would you <laughs> characterize the differences between that and run-of-the-mill cedar? Uh, so, mahogany, sorry. Yeah, uh, so most if you have played old mahogany, Spanish mahogany is very similar. It, it's okay. slightly compressed. It's got kind of that nice, you know, I'm going to make it, since you're on Zoom and I can use my Italian hand gesture, sure. you know, it's got that nice, long, kind of slow ramp, slow decay, smooth wave to it, sonic, you know, 
Yeah. Of course, uh, it's not like, Italian or a hand, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, when you play like a Fender style guitar, uh, you know, with a maple neck and stuff, you know, it's a very fast initial ramp up on the, you know, and then a very quick decay, that more staccato type sound. Uh, I personally intend to end, most of our stuff ends up being in the Gibson camp. So that's, that's part of why that formula works so well for us. And I'm also convinced you cannot build a bad sounding guitar out of Spanish mahogany. I'm just convinced. I mean, I've built Strat style guitars with it. I've built basses with it. Uh, the basses still have maple necks, but uh, you know, Spanish mahogany bodies, they sound, they always sound so good. Uh, if I was building like a genty metal, you know, modern, like an Ormsby or something, that would be the wrong combination. Sure. But for what we're trying to do, it always just sounds so good. And it's light. Um, we, because it's not very in demand commercially, uh, we tend to be one of the larger consumers of it, which means I get to be more picky mm -hmm. about the stuff that comes into the shop, the company that we work with and the mill they work with. They know what we like now. We've been buying it for 10 years. Um, so they're good about, you know, we usually buy four to six units a year. Uh, they'll bring it up. They'll season it in their warehouse because we only can store so much of it at a time. They'll bring us out a unit about every month and a half. Uh, and then we season and store that as long as we can too. Um, and nice thing too is Banshee's actually fairly material efficient. So the stuff that maybe isn't wide enough to do a two-piece body blank will almost always do Banshee's, mm -hmm. um, especially because it's neck through and it's, it's got more small pieces and stuff. So we, we probably use 90 to 95% of what we bring in. We, we don't waste very much, which may, also makes me very That's happy good. Yeah, uh, from an environmental per point of view. I saw a, a video on your website. I think it was on your website uh, where it showed uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the mix of the CNC and that sort of sure. stuff along with the hand stuff. And Our one video. Yeah, okay, that's the one. <laughs> it wasn't finished. I was a little concerned about that. Yeah. I get to it. Moving on. Yeah. But I saw one, one scene, scene, one shot um, where it looked like you were cutting out a banshee. Mm -hmm. and, and it was the body and the neck. So when you say yep. neck through, is it all one piece? Uh, it's, it's glued up as one piece, but the neck is actually four pieces technically. So oh, okay. what we do is we... It depends on how the material works out. Sometimes it'll start as a one piece neck and then we'll cut it, take the stress out of the neck. Uh, and then, uh, and this is an old woodworking trick. And then basically we'll reverse, you know, we'll flip it that yeah. way. So if there's any movement in the neck, they naturally counteract each other. Uh, but a lot of times the Banshee neck sections are, because, you know, when you look at the grain of how this material comes in, usually it's flat sawn, but it'll kind of tend to be quartered at the edge of the boards. Sure. So if the boards are wide enough to work, we'll slice the quarter section off, set that aside for banshee necks, and then use the rest for either wings or, you know, super chief body cores or something else. Right. Uh, and then so, and then so the, that's how we make the neck section. It's usually three pieces. Um, and then we scarf joint it and then glue the headstock in. And the reason we do that is that's what makes that joint way stronger than a traditional firebird, uh, which is a known weak point. And we, we custom build our own truss rods where we haven't built for us. So our truss rod channel where it comes out of the headstock is only a quarter inch deep by a quarter inch wide. So the big cutout swoop. Mm. That's a very small, you know, almost like the, uh, like, a, like a fender headstock. I mean, you know, where it's just the axis for the element. It's pretty close to that. Uh, so it leaves a lot of material there. Um, and then, but the other key thing is what we really do with Banshee that solves a lot of problems is because those guitars are notoriously tricky to balance, the headstocks are always, always, always made, no matter if they're pretty or ugly or what, from the lightest boards that come into the shop. So immediately when we go through the, the pile, whatever boards are the lightest, they only become Banshee headstocks, in, unless we have more than we need. Um, occasionally a few body books. Uh, and so that takes a bunch of weight off the headstock end because it's got heavy tuners. Sure. Um, and then we use the heaviest boards we can to make the wings uh, because in the end, Banshee is only an inch and a half thick in the center, uh, and it's an inch and a quarter of the wing, so there's not a lot of material there. So heavy boards, you know, aren't like, they're not going to end with a heavy guitar because there's right. so little left, but they'll be heavier than the neck and the headstock especially, sure. um, and that puts the mass back where we want it, and that makes a huge difference on that guitar. Yeah, uh, well, that's the biggest problem with my Firebird is yep. the dip, so yeah. Yep. Yeah, we... 
I, I call Banshee, so it's not neck heavy, we call it neck neutral. So like Daylighter, Super Chief, um, most of the other models tend to balance uphill a little bit, which I like. Mm -hmm. um, Banshee balances just kind of neutrally, you know, parallel to the ground, doesn't dip, doesn't really, you know, that's fine. That's, getting it that far is, is a pretty good accomplishment on that guitar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The Super Chief, now you've talked a lot about that, and that's, that's the bigger body, almost, uh, yeah. Big almost, hollow almost, body. A, almost a jazz style almost right? yeah it's it's a 15 and a half inch semi hollow um it's the biggest thing i've ever made that guitar is the epitome of everything i've ever done i i yeah. i'm kind of honestly i've been in a creative rut because i don't know what to make next <laughs> like, oh, that guitar Trey is, and i've got some ideas so we'll yeah. talk about that later <laughs> yeah that one is you know and and that one i knew came together well because uh it's it's based on starliner which was our kind of our last poly model um, so I started with that shape and scaled it up to the, the bigger body. And I, I think I literally, I think this is when I only had one kid. I, I think I dropped my kid off at school or daycare and was like driving into work. I thought, I want to, I want to design this thing today. I want to make it happen. And by the time the guys got to the shop, I had it drawn, programmed, ready to run on the CNC in like an hour. And that generally, and, and I think other than a couple under the hood changes, nothing's changed on the guitar. Um, yeah. To me, that's usually an indicator that the design is spot on. It's a good, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I have this like I have this Strati-ish bolt-on model that we've experimented with for the last year, and I have one, I have two of them for myself right now. I have a, the Titan version and the Tower version, and like that's a guitar that's like I feel like it's five percent away from being where I want it to be, and I can't mm -hmm. figure out how to get it there. I don't know what it is. I just not and everybody else. That has seen it and played it likes it and i keep looking at it thinking it's not quite there yet and it's driving me insane <laughs> right well yeah that's you just need to step away and yeah and come yeah. back fresh and it'll go oh well that's what it was yeah it's like, it's yeah, it's like a song. yeah well starliner shape was like that so before starliner came out i had another model i had drawn and i was in that same rut like i just it just wasn't quite what i wanted to be and i finally just gave up and started fresh and then starliner came to me almost immediately. So like, I'm not quite ready to scrap this thing yet, but I, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's stuck in some, it has some edge what's in your head, but you can't quite see what's in your head. Yeah. Yet, so you'll know it when you see it. Yep. Yeah. I think that's, that's what it is. And I, I like it. I really like playing it. The couple that I've built that I, I've really enjoyed. Cause I actually played strats exclusively before I started building guitars. Um, oh. So I and, still get and yet that. You ended up in more the Gibson arena. That's interesting. Yeah, probably because I had so many straps. Right. <laughs> but I still get the itch every once in a while. So our purse was kind of that way. It was kind of our first, you know, coward bolt on model because I just right. needed a strategy thing to play. Um, Titan or Care or one model, which Titan we've, we've kind of, we're probably going to keep discontinued for now. Um, I That's another one of those models that it's, it's, that guitar hit so perfectly for me. The follow-up models that we kind of added to the lineup, I just I haven't been happy with. Uh, yeah. I, I like them, and people who bought those like them. Sure. Um, but it's still in the Starliner, Super Chief, General, Balt family, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to be stuck here for life. I can't. It's just I, I think I hit exactly what I want, and I don't know what to do now. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> It's like writing that hit book, and then you you gotta write the second one, and you're like, uh, oh, can I do this twice? <laughs> well, super on the, chief. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, I just before I, before we get too far away from it, I wanted to kind of circle back to the the, the aesthetic design of things. Uh, so the first thing that I thought of when I was looking at all the different um, you know kind of custom designs that you've done over the years was like this. I don't think it would be like Art Deco. That's not the right word, but like a. It reminded me of like the old movie posters for like Metropolis. Sure. Um, like, was that an intentional thing or did it just kind of come out that way? Like, uh, is there a secret, like, I'm a big fan of 90s Batman cartoons. And so <laughs> that's where all of the design elements and everything came from? Or is it just kind, kind of, of a, there's a kind of a European feel to it almost. Sure. Isn't there? Yeah. Well, I, got, I would say with Argo, especially as Super Chief. Yeah. I, I And we've done some Argonauts that have leaned way into that, that had... Yeah. Art Deco pickguard styles and and you know uh, and ironically we've done some that were kind of super based and stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, it probably a little bit mostly because again, like Claudio, who's Swiss, and and some of these people that I really like, 
um, or European, um, you know, and then there's guys like Saul Cole, who I subconsciously rip off all the time. Uh, <laughs> and he reminded me many times that I've done it and I owe him can a lot of fear. Can you call yeah. it subconsciously if the guy is actually reminding you anything? Yeah, well, it seems he, like... he's pointed it out and then we, I just pay him in beer where I see him. So oh, it's, it's a good relationship. That works nice. uh, and I, I won't remind him that our trade for a Banshee and a Cole for me has, he's had his Banshee for years now and I haven't got my pull yet. Uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, if he's watching right now, hey, hey buddy. You get him on the phone. We'll talk to him. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I, God, I don't even have time to play anymore these days. But, yeah, it, one day it'll happen. And then I'll finally realize all the things I stole from him because I'll have it in person. But, uh, I, you know, it's not a conscious effort. Like, I yeah. – I mean uh, – I think part of it's, you know, I grew up restoring 60s Pontiacs with my dad. Mm, uh, so it. I had a lot of stuff in that wheelhouse. And, sure. and, and then I got into building Volvos, oddly, mm -hmm. after that, because they were just obscure and they weren't, there's not a Jags catalog for Volvo. And uh, uh, I think that's kind of the same thing with the guitars. Like, I, that's why I like to build something that's a little off the beaten path and, you right. know, people to be a little surprised by it. Uh, it's interesting that you had the car connection since the Firebird itself was designed by a car designer. Yep. Yep. So that's interesting. Yeah, and Banshee is the original name for the Pontiac Firebird. That's true. I forgot about that. Yep. Um, yeah, they uh, they nixed it because they realized – I actually just read this the other day. I mean, I, I kind of do the background, but uh, the name Banshee means screaming demon or screaming wailing witch or something like that, and they thought first time somebody got killed in a Pontiac Firebird – it would write its own headline or Banshee Pontiac Banshee. Yeah. And they thought, nah, that's not a great idea. <laughs> but it worked perfectly for me. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> you know, one of the things I was going to mention about the Super Chief is it's, it's one of those shapes that as you look at it straight ahead, it's, um, it's got a sense of, it's not quite balanced. And then as soon as you mm -hmm. put it in the playing position, it's like, it just clicks. It's like, oh, well, my God, yep. that's the way it's supposed to be looked at. And not yep. all guitars feel that way. A Les Paul doesn't particularly feel that way to me. But I think a Les Paul looks amazing hanging on the wall. And then you pick it up and you look at it on anybody who's not, you know, a heroin addict or Jimmy Page. Uh, and it looks tiny. It doesn't look right. Yeah. You know, uh, so then, you know, I'm not a heroin addict uh, or Jimmy Page. Uh, I'm a what? Large, large fellow here. So hiding behind a large 15 and a half inch guitar is kind of nice. Um, well, and the thing too is, is Super Chief is offset. So it's yeah. 15 and a half inches, I don't know, if, you know, this way on an angle. So right. it, because it's kind of ramping like Jazzmaster, like Banshee, mm -hmm. things I kind of learned early on when I got away from strats, um, you can get away with that big guitar. It's not uncomfortable. Uh, everything kind of starts to fall in place for where you expect it to be. Uh, and it's, Probably also because I tend to draw this way. <laughs> and, and occasionally I've had to do that. Like I'll print something out to sketch on. I'm like, oh, yeah, this does look weird hanging on the wall. I guess I should think about that because if I sell them to stores, they're going to hang on the walls. But, uh, but uh, that, like, that's, but that's I, definitely the how. The, the use position is cool, though. I mean, yeah. that's my choppers wouldn't look very good like this. You yeah. know, like this will look good. It's just a thing. Yeah, you got to put it in that position. You, you know, even like the logo is – you know, it doesn't, it's running vertically when it's hanging on the wall, but when it's flopped over, it's the oh, correct right. way. Interesting. Uh, you know, fender, that's a fender way too, but. Uh, no, yeah. I, I, I think that like, that's, that's kind of the thing that attracted me to offsets in the first place, other than the fact that my metabolism slowed down and I got a little thicker than I used to be. Uh, <laughs> And, and I can kind of, I can kind of hide that now, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, the idea of, it's going to be Gretsch know, next. I, He's going to have the big one, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> as, as it continues to decline, oh, I'm going to uh, make a Plexi, Plexi super cheap that I'm going to grind the backside. So it, it visually, when you look through it, everything gets smaller on the backside. <laughs> nice. I'm going to sell so many yes. of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But just got to like, keep it above the waist. <laughs> right, right, right. The, 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 Why the, can I not get any chicks, man? Yeah. Uh, Paper's really down. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do the reverse kind of guitars for those folks. Yes, yeah. For the low slingers, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> 
See, <laughs> now you got something new to invent. That's uh, yeah, awesome. That's it. That's what I'm going to work on tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, it's, well, I mean, uh, you know, like I, I am adamantly convinced if Leo Fender had put a strat trim and strat pickups on a Jazzmaster, that's the guitar we'd be playing today. Uh, you think? That, that offset shape. Really? Uh, obviously, one of us here, two of us here are fans. Oh, I've got, uh, got several. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a perfect shape. Mm-hmm. And, and that, you know, like, I mean, I don't know. There's two, there's two frames of thought. Uh, you know, you're either you like Cindy Crawford because her mole makes her face unsymmetrical or it drives you insane. You know, I, I tend right. to be in the, I like asymmetric. I like the offset thing, right. uh, you know. Well, it, it, I've fallen in, like, I don't know when it happened, but at one point I, you know, picked up a, a jazz master at an old shop that I worked at, and I just went, I don't hate this anymore. Yeah. And I did for a very, very long time. <laughs> like, like, I was staunch, like, who, like, why, all of the, all of the questions, like, why would you do this to yourself? Like, why mm-hmm. would you want to play this? And then suddenly, you know, it, I, it was me. I changed yeah. something in, inside because uh, it, it just, I picked it up and went, maybe it was the, the kind of the, the function and the form that, sure. that got me. But now I, I mean, I probably every- shouldn't let Mike Adams hear this, but I still hate a jazz master. I don't, I, I don't, or I don't love a jazz master. I, a, a traditional straight sure. ahead. I, it, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> We went so long. I was just thinking. I know. I guess you finally read really my good. tech. It's because you, you said you didn't like Jazz Master. Somebody was calling. Yep. <laughs> like, no, 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 I, no, no. I, I find for me that I, they're just not what I want me out of a guitar. Sure. I don't, I, I get it. It's not my wheelhouse, but the shape is perfect. I, I, I and, for me, and the shape is just so, lends itself so well now. Uh, ironically, we're not really doing anything with that shape because I think, Again, this is gonna sound super conceited, but because Dennis and I kind of cracked that door open for it, now there's so many people doing it. And I'm like, I'm gonna be good making something else for a while now. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to be the guy who helped bring that back. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a uh, the like the original Jazzmaster anyway is is a good uh, template or a good palette yeah. for for other things, and because it's so open ended, and they kind of went, okay, well we're gonna throw the craziest at least period wise the craziest stuff that we can throw into a guitar design yep. and so that put the threshold way up here and so everybody when you bring it down here then it's way more accessible and it's, way, and it's almost do- like uh, the 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 old school version of coach building you know where you'd mm-hmm. buy a car or you'd buy a, basically a chassis if you were rich and you had some other shop make the body and do all the mm-hmm. stuff jazzmaster is the perfect coach building guitar yeah, uh, but you're yeah. right, Trey. It's the, the fact that they did throw a, a pretty complex trim on there, and multiple switches, and and multiple types of switches, and knobs, mm-hmm. and different pickguard components and stuff. It it did so, kind of so free, anything else free feels it. tame. Well, like yeah. it, comparatively. Well, if you look at a Les Paul, if you start messing around with pickups on a Les Paul, it, it starts to not feel right. You, if you put whammies on a Les Paul, unless it's a Bigsby, which originally came on them. It, yeah. Once again, it it feels like you're messing with something that shouldn't be messed with, but. And even on a Strat, you know, you can only go so far before it starts to feel like, oh, that's just a modded thing. Right. With, with the Jazzmaster shape or that offset shape, man, the sky's the limit as long as you make it look classy you yeah. know, in right. one way or another. Yeah, I think if it had been successful, we probably would be stuck, you know, we wouldn't be able to change it. I mean, or more successful, you know, if it, it's, because that was, that was the whole thing with Daylighter. I wanted to, yeah. you know, I, I hate a Les Paul. I want to live a Les Paul. Uh, and I, and and I love how they sound, and I want to love them, but I they're not ergonomically what I want out of a guitar. Uh, that shape, you know, Daylighter was a carved top jazz master, Les Paul, basically. It was Les Paul design idea, you know, in jazz master shape, and, you know, that's why we made a lot of them. Right. <laughs> kind of went, you know, wow, this is great. And then Fender made the carved top jazz master, and I was like, hey, I see you watching us. Uh, <laughs> which and and they've done like it, it's it's ironic too and and again as someone who really loves offset guitars the there is a manufacturer who will remain nameless that misses the mark with their own design yeah uh and it's 
I'm kind of glad. <laughs> it, but but it'll, it allows so many other designers to do the cool stuff without, you know, stepping on anyone else's toes. Because sure. uh, pretty much every Jazzmaster Jaguar that I've had, I've completely gutted and changed and made it my own thing. Yep. I've never kept one stock. Um, but, I don't think anybody has. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but in contrast, the offsets that I've owned that weren't from Fender... Yeah, I've pretty much left the way that they are. Yeah. So like I, I do like the the kind of open ended and and almost you know the happy accident of the fact that it the the original isn't sure. as popular or as finished as maybe a lot of players would want. Yeah, I won't lie. The hipster in me uh, probably would hate would have hated Jazzmaster if they were popular. Uh, yeah. To be honest, that, that was kind of the appeal that. It's the you know, underdog thing, right? Yep. Yeah. It's why I build bubbles and it's why I do anything I do is, you know, I, I mean, for a guy who grew up playing strats, if I never saw another strat in my life, I would be totally okay with that. Like I right. just, there's just so much more out there, you know, some designs and some things that come along in history and they're perfect and they catch like wildfire and they deserve to, but I, I'm good staying on the fringes. I, I like kind of, uh, you know, I was also a kid of the eighties and so, uh, <laughs> you know, kinda, well, there's a there's a there's an allure moment. to that like um you know I, i'm not a crazy sonic youth fan mm -hmm. but, but what they did to their guitars to make them perfect for their specific thing um you know it's gonna be the, i'm yeah. sorry guys <laughs> i <laughs> okay you know what? You know what? Hang on. We're going to solve this right now. Tommy, stop calling. I love you, Tommy. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hopefully solved. <laughs> I love you, kid. Now, don't bother me. <laughs> uh, there's others. Yeah, that's my, my, my son's cousin. My wife's cousin. Oh. Uh, or, or yeah eh. anyway they're cute they're all on quarantine so they just desperately want to see each other but dear god if you don't pick up he just calls you back until <sighs> he can't he's sleeping oh, okay that was 29 facetimes ago buddy give it up <laughs> he didn't pick up he must not be dead <laughs> yeah oh my god uh yeah it's uh that's the whole other diversion uh <laughs> but that like you know what what you were saying about the that's kind of my bridge for the i want to just play because yeah. i can i can do all of the the techie nerdy stuff at the front end and then it's the perfect guitar for what i need and then i can kind of coddle my punk and hardcore sensibilities that just wants to play sure and and kind of abuse the instrument a little <laughs> bit uh, which is cool that like you you know you built this really really nice guitar for an Irish punk band. Yep. <laughs> Which is just, I mean, I grew up on Flogging Molly, so that's that's always been a cool kind of thing that, that I've liked about. people to hang out with. I, I yeah. love, love the band. Um, you know, that honestly, that whole thing really started not because of anything I did. It was, again, one of those industry connections where Dennis plays satellite amps and he's great friends with Adam and I'm good friends with Adam and he just came across this Daylighter Junior that was at Adam's place, and that was it. He took yeah. it out on the road, and then, you know, he's got a star liner to Banshee now. And, and Dennis is one of those guys. Uh, so the way we do artist stuff is, you know, we can't give things away. Sure. That's our philosophy. Our, well, that's our official policy. But there's an unofficial policy where people that we have good relationships where I like working with who I know are not hung up on, you know, oh, my God, there's a speck in the finish or something. When I'm flexing something new out, they tend to be my kind of early testers. And Dennis is yeah. one of those guys. Uh, you know, he, he tends to get stuff that, you know, or, or if I have to train somebody new in the shop on a job that, you you know, especially on the finishing end where I know I'm just going to have to sacrifice some stuff for a while. Um, right. You know, that, you know, those are the kind of guitars that go to artists of ours for air quotes free here they're not free they're usually they still give me you know i they'll usually cover the hardware and stuff and we'll take the labor but right. uh you know dennis is one of those guys he you know he gets i, I love the guy he he 
genuinely, you know, sends me an email a couple times a year just to say, hey, man, I played my Day Letter Jr. on this song. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Hope you're good. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> Which Tom DeMont awesome. like that. Tom DeMont, yeah. no doubt, was a, is a supremely nice, just an unbelievably nice guy to work with uh, who I didn't know we sold him a guitar until I saw it on Instagram because – he just bought one and there was yeah. no, I'm Tom Dumont, uh, yeah. you know, you know, and, and uh, we saw it on Instagram when he was out with uh, the new band dream car. And uh, I was like, holy shit, dude, that's, you know, and, and like, as I'm realizing this, I started getting texts from friends. Like, I didn't know you still look at, you know, I didn't know Tom Dumont. <laughs> like, I'm like yeah. I legitimately didn't know either. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't think twice when I saw the name. I just, you know, okay. And ship the guitar out. And, and then he had ordered one. Uh, and it ran late. It was aged finished, which we don't do in house. And it just kind of, you know, things that were a little bit beyond our control. And uh, so he'd been playing one. He'd had the one in order. Uh, and when it was done, I told him, I was like, hey, man, you know, I really appreciate you playing our stuff. Um, I, and I would have done this for anybody, but I was like, I feel bad that it went so long. I'm going to take a little bit off the balance, you know, as a, you know, sure. thanks so much. He adamantly refused to take any amount off the guitar. He, he wanted to pay full price. Left me a really nice note about, you know, uh, how he's been fortunate in his life and stuff and uh, it was great we had a great time hanging out with him when they came through uh with dream car a couple years ago and um you know i that's the whole reality of it with artists for us I, you know we we don't have a huge artist roster but i have the people that play are so i mean unbelievably fortunate that they do uh, and it's kind of surreal that they do uh the most surreal moment i ever had uh was uh, uh this is a few years ago obviously before he passed uh, when Steely Dan came through town, the last time we got to see them, um, you know, I took my dad, my, my, who was a diehard, die, you know, he was born in the fifties. He, he's that, he's that age. He is the Steely Dan age. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, and I'd met Walter, you know, I got to hang out with him a few times, but you know, I hadn't got to drag dad along. So we got to take dad and, you know, he got to meet Walter and hang out and, and uh, we bullshitted about uh, every, every time with him was a, you know, you'd have some totally off planet discussion with him about whatever. Uh, and it, you know, <laughs> nothing about guitars and stuff. And dad just sat there uh, and watched <laughs> this happen. Yeah. And then, you know, watched the show and, and uh, uh, you know, we went home. And, and the next day I was like, that had to be surreal, right? Like for yeah. me, I, cause I've been through the loop a few times now. Like it wasn't, it was, it was great, but it wasn't this out of body experience. But I'm like, dad, is a diehard Steely Dan fan, and he's sitting here backstage listening to Walter Becker talk about alien life forms uh, <laughs> because his kid built a guitar one day because he was bored. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, right. That's just such a weird, surreal arc to have been on. Some days uh, he's gladder than others. You didn't go into the cabinet thing. Yeah, well, I was stuck. I was adamant I was not going to do that. I, right. I've done I've, this part of the hard time about guitar design is my brain is permanently at cabinet right angles on the designs. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, so I've been very fortunate for that. Uh, we had some, so many moments like that where it's, you know, this is, this is a difficult way to make a living realistically. Right. Uh, and, and honestly, I'm going to put it down right now. The proudest I've ever been of my business is paying my employees salary for six weeks to stay at home. Um, That's awesome. before, I mean, that was, a lot of it was just lucky and good timing, but you know, that was a huge accomplishment. Because sure. uh, they've, you know, Andrew, a couple of the guys have been with me a long time. You know, Andrew's been with me before we were taking paychecks home. We were just, we were, you know, every set went back to the business and we, you know, he was 18 and living at home and I was 26 and didn't have kids yet or whatever, um, you know, and living on my wife's income. And, and it's been nice to see that grow. Um, but yeah, it's 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 such a weird business. It's so, it, it really those, is. Those moments are so great, and and you know the connections that I've made and friendships that I've made through this through you know going to shows and hanging out with people. You know, we only do events because I want to go see friends, and right. and I think it'll be fun to go to that town. Usually, that's how we kind of how we decide them now. Like you know, people are like, oh, you gonna sell guitars? And, you know, you, I don't play. Yeah. I'm going to Berlin. I don't care. Yeah. I'm going to go have fun because I know I'm never going to have an excuse to go again. And, uh, and, and I'm going to eat a lot of sausage and drink a lot of beer. And, and if we sell something, we do. And if we don't, whatever. You know, that, 
that's how I feel about touring. Like it's weird for me to travel when I don't have a musical purpose. Sure. Cause I go and I'm like, all right, but when do we load in? Like what, what, <laughs> what, what uh, so what are we doing here? <laughs> like, <laughs> if, go, if we didn't have the business as a reason to do this, we probably, I probably still wouldn't have a passport to be honest. Like I, yeah. I love to travel, but we we were never, my wife and I aren't like the, we didn't go to Europe on our honeymoon kind of people. We, you know, sure. we went to Seattle because we had friends there. Mm. Um, you know, we used to live there for a while. But, you know, and so it's been the business. I, I kind of resigned myself, and we both have, that these opportunities with the business don't come along very often. And mm. if I'm never going to get rich doing this, I, my only goal is to just be self-sustaining and keep my sure. employees paid well. Um, but I will take advantage of the, the fun trips. Uh, yeah, the birds. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got him. <laughs> well, and that that um, you know that kind of leads into the the one thing that we always want to do with with pretty much any guests that we have is is talk about. Uh, we want to throw at least one top five question at you. Sure. Um, so, my personal favorite, and I think Jet, Jets is too, is if you had to pick a top five favorite albums. All right, I can do that one. Um, what would they be, um, and, and, and or why? Well, I can tell you number one for sure. It's funny, I was just thinking about this today, uh, is The Last Waltz is my all-time, all-time favorite album. I know it's probably not the best band album, but it's still my favorite one. Uh, okay. That one is easily number one. Uh, number two... I think it's a little tougher. Live at the Fillmore, Allman Brothers, probably number two. Okay. Uh, number three would be... I guess he does like the sound of Les Pauls. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll solve that too, though. Uh, SRV's first album. Uh, right. and, uh, number four. Ooh, that's a good question. A lot of middle pickup on that. I was about to say, a yeah. A lot of middle pickup. Middle. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I do like a middle pickup. We, we brought uh, it back. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we call it. Back. Yes. Uh, four and five is a little tougher. Uh, it, that starts to stray into me for more. I could give you an artist, but maybe not a specific album. You know, almost all of Clapton's history. Uh, there's a lot of jazz in that stuff that I listen. I love listen to a lot of jazz, and I that I would have a hard time pinning an album down. Uh, ah, yeah, guitar four. jazz, horn jazz, piano jazz. A little bit of everything. Um, Coltrane. I love Count Basie. Count Basie is one of my favorites. Sure. Uh, you know, Art Blakey. Miles. Uh, Miles, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm you still gotta pick one, that, man. You got to pick one. <laughs> yeah, at I'm least still one convinced artist. that Monk, every Monk song is exactly the same song, just with a different name. But that's my one jazz gripe. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's not well, controversial at all. <laughs> we won't get any threads started from that. Yeah, so. right. No. Um, let's see. All right, I'll throw an oddball one out. Uh, when I was younger, I would say Eric Johnson's first album was uh, would be on that list. Oh, okay. There you go. There you go. You know, uh, Robert Cray too would be Lost Track guys. Yeah. He, Another middle pickup or, guy. Yeah. Robert Cray. Some of these guys, though, I have love hates with because they had uh, albums that I like and love, and then a lot of albums that I just don't right. care. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would probably say number five for me truly would have been From the Cradle by Clapton. That that one I okay. was in a solid rotation. Um, you know. Oh no. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna, Hold I, on, I, tickets. I, Hang on. I, yeah. I'm going to make a slight amendment here. I'm going to put this at number one and a half to fix the list here. What? Yeah, uh, and it's totally left field, and you will not guess this one from me based on that list. But Save Ferris's first album is a perfect <laughs> album. <laughs> <laughs> it is still uh, a almost weekly album on the playlist uh, for me. Wow. Uh, so yeah, there's a left field choice. Um, I, I, yeah, I yeah, wouldn't, yeah. Wouldn't have and we got to use our bleep machine, so that's. <laughs> We've been just waiting this whole time. We're like, oh, yeah, We're, one day. Uh, well, like, I'm glad I popped the cherry and it wasn't yelling at my, my nephew. Uh, <laughs> that was a missed opportunity. <laughs> right? But yeah, that's a St. Ferris album, man. That's a, that's a perfect album. I, I, 
I'll throw that one out uh, as a one in my top five for sure, near the top. Well, that's that's a nice that's a nice rounded bunch. Yeah, yeah. It, it's you know, it's reflective of the guitars I build. It's in that vein. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would be remiss. I would say okay before I get in trouble. Um, Rival Sons is not on that list because I couldn't narrow it down to one album, and I couldn't narrow it down to not overwriting all five albums. So, but they are on that one video. Yes. Oh well, they are. I love those guys. I <laughs> get mad, get in trouble for not putting them on that list. They they would yep. definitely be on all of that list. <laughs> so please keep playing our guitar, Scott. <laughs> 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 yeah, their their new record that they they put out. What was it like late last year? Yeah, was so good. It's really good. Uh, it came out right around damn. Actually, I think I listened to it uh, on the drive back and forth. Uh, okay, yeah. No, I knew it was. Man, time doesn't mean anything any me anymore. I know. <laughs> to I know. Me. Why I was late to get here. Yeah, we're, <laughs> like we're almost halfway. That's three through different the year. reasons he's given us, by the way. Uh, I mean, those of you more. keeping track. That'll yeah. be my Just easier saying. top five list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Top five top reasons five. <laughs> I was late for the podcast. Uh, well, there's my my son's cousin. First of all. <laughs> Let me but, get him on yeah. the phone. Bleep, a bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can make it sound like you cursed in blue, so that'll be nice. I'll oh, just, uh, yeah. yeah. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> just start, pot, pot, just start uh, editing out words that have put the, nothing put the, to do. The, the, the black bar with the little characters, you know, <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. That'll be fine. <laughs> well, you guys. Yeah, Jet, you got any more uh, more questions or anything? No, I'm so thrilled to have had a chance to talk to the guy who makes some of my my favorite guitars that I haven't yet purchased. Mostly well, because I'm, it's going to take me the the zero code Banshee that you got in the shop is awesome, and I do yeah, love that. That one's really good. But but once I saw the the bevel top ones and the hollow, I was like, oh, I got to say, I, I almost had him on that one, and then he started doing <laughs> research. And then and I now, saw the Argonaut, like, I'm like, oh, I got to just... wait for an Argonaut, and then I found out they're not making them, and so now I'm like, well, I got to meet this guy and convince him to start making they, Argonauts. They, what do I need to do, start a podcast? Up. Okay. <laughs> so finally, we can quit this podcast thing, because I finally got this guy on, and I can tell him, please make an Argonaut. <laughs> At some point, I, I we might, uh, I might, I might sneak one in there. Uh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen to my album. If, you know, I've you got probably a hundred followers. There you go. And see what you think. We'll work something out. <laughs> yep, done. <Yeah. laughs> that was it. That was that was that was the formula. Oh, thank God. <laughs> we can we can hang up our capes now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Really, it was great, and we appreciate you taking the time. And uh, obviously, you had a lot of phone calls you could have been taking, and we <laughs> we're so, so happy you decided to talk to us. Deep this Minecraft time. right now, man. Yeah, I know. You're gonna have some family catching up to do, and and some. Okay, actually, I, I will say this before you go. Uh, yeah. My favorite thing to do is to log on to Minecraft as my seven-year-old, and then go and pretend to be him when his cousin calls, and then just. <laughs> Just go dynamite their entire world, and then then listen to them scream at my son for messing up their Minecraft world, and it just brings me. I realized that whenever I was playing games in you know in high school and stuff, video games online when that was like first come out, like early Call of Duty and stuff, there would be that one guy that would just play to kill his teammates. Yes, I always thought it was some jerk thirteen year old. I realized now nope. it was really some thirteen year old kid's dad, a yeah. troll dad. Yeah, it was, it was playing. <laughs> It was playing the original Halo with my cousin, waiting yep. for them to let their guard down and just whap. Yep. <laughs> He's like, stop. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it brings me a lot of joy. And then they get so surprised that I know how to play video games. I'm like, I'm 36, guys. I'm not that old. Good Lord. Like, we're, uh, uh, this is, yeah, this is what being parents is now. Yeah, that's fun. I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't know, but I can. I, I'm so excited for when I get that opportunity. This to one just... part is fun. It's this one part is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's, that was the one, huh? That's Damn, it. I was kind of the hoping one. there was going to be something else come down the road. <laughs> no, it's it's. I've so far, that's it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I'll let you go. Thank Man. you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. For. Uh, 
For Doug Cower, Trey Hawkins, uh, and Giggs, I'm Jet Stone, and we'll see you all later. So glad you could join us for another episode of Gear and Gigs, the music podcast. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. And stick around, watch another video, listen to another podcast. Till then, we'll see you next time.